glad that you braved the weather and that you came to a warm place, not physically warm, but a place where we come with a warm heart to worship God together. We've been looking and studying the names of God, been uh, letting God show us some of his selfies. The first one we talked about was Elohim. That's the word that's used in the first two chapters of the book of Genesis. It reveals the creative power of God. We also looked at Adonai, which is the, the word that identifies God as the master, the ruler, but it isn't just the authoritative ruler, it's the caring master, the one who, who has a possession but is deeply caring about his subjects. We then looked at the word Jehovah, revealing the relational character of God, the fact that he is a covenant God, he wants to have connection with the creatures he's created. We then examined how that Jehovah gets attached with other words, Jehovah Jireh, where God is the provider, and you'll remember that's the word that Abraham used as he was to sacrifice Isaac, but God stayed his hand, and God provided the ram for them at that instant. Jehovah Rapha was how God was going to be the res restorer, it's oftentimes thought of as healer. We looked at the fact that where that first shows up in scripture is where there is bitter water. And we talked about God's restoration is so much more than to desire our physical well-being. He desires our spiritual well-being. He desires that we not be stuck in the bitter waters, uh, that we be restored. So that's another Jehovah name. We looked at Jehovah Nisi. God is the banner. As long as Moses' uh, hands were held high, the uh, battle was won. We looked at Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. And then we looked at Jehovah Sidkenu, the God of righteousness. We spent two weeks looking at that, talking about God's righteousness and then about how God has made a plan for us to be righteous. And then last time we were together, we looked at El Elyon, the God Most High. So today we're going to take another picture, and we're going to look at El Shaddai. I'm just going to start right out by showing you the first appearance of this word in Genesis chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him saying, I am God Almighty. Live in my presence and be devout. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on the ground, and God spoke with him. As for me, my covenant is with you, and you will become the father of many nations. Your name will no longer be Abram, but your name will be Abraham. Yeah. For I will make you a father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful and will make nations and kings come from you. So there is the first appearance of El Shaddai. I am God Almighty. As uh, last time, we looked at El being a shortened form of Elohim. So it has to do with the power that God contains. And Shaddai... The second part of that name means mighty, it means sufficient, it means enough. I did some research on a site that was actually the ancient Hebrew research center, and I became enthralled um, with the word Shaddai. There, it's really hard, especially for, in the Hebrew, to, to get the Hebrew literal into the Western words that, under, that represent what the Hebrew literal was. Oftentimes, we would just be puzzled if some of these Hebrew words were just translated from, from what they actually are. So many times, scholars really labor in an attempt to bring what that word was into the understanding for the Western, Western mind. The, the parent root word of Shaddai is the word shad. Literally, it means two danglers. That's what it literally means. It's a reference that uh, primarily was used of a mother goat and how that mother goat would provide nourishment for her young ones. Everything that was necessary for life and growth was sustained by the two danglers. So literally, in Hebrew, 
if we were translating El Shaddai, it is the god of two danglers. So we put that all together. El Shaddai means almighty, not just mighty, but almighty. It means all sufficient, not just sufficient. It means more than enough. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what we ask or think. God's more than enough. He's more than enough. One source I looked at used the word overpowerer. God is the overpowerer. And then literally, in that Hebrew, God is the mighty teeth. He is the one who supplies the nourishment that is necessary for his young ones. It's interesting that the first appearance of this word in Scripture comes in connection with God providing descendants, children. In other words, this truly is a word that gives us a picture of the feminine side of God. And it's actually said to Abraham as the God who's going to supply children. We would also notice that it is, it is tied to the name change. Abram means exalted father. Abraham is going to be father of a multitude. So God's telling Abram, I'm going to nurture you in such a way that you're going to be a father of multitude, nations. So let's look at a couple of things this reveals about God. First of all, it reveals that maternal strength of God, that maternal strength of God. A few years ago, there was a book, I think, was it called The Shack? that some of you may have read, and, and the author chose to represent the God figure in that fictional book as, as a female. And there were people really, really struggled with the idea of God, God having a feminine side. But El Shaddai truly is a revelation of God's maternal strength. The promise of Abraham's son has been made, yet it's not been uh, realized yet. Sarah, Abraham, and Hagar developed their own, own plan but God uses El Shaddai to inform Abraham that he will bring the birth of a son. And not just the birth of a son, but he is going to so well nourish the seed of Abraham that he is going to become the father of a multitude of nations. And that through his seed, all nations are going to be blessed. That's a reference to Jesus. God is telling Abraham, I'm going to nurture you to a place of unbelievable acknowledgement in this world. Deity's maternal nature is spoken of often in Scripture, so if, if we struggle with it, we need to look at the book. Psalm chapter 56 says, I will seek refuge in the shadow of your wings until danger passes. I will seek refuge in the shelter of your wings. In Isaiah chapter 49 Zion says, uh, Jerusalem is saying, God, you've forgotten us. And God's response is, can a woman forget her nursing child or lack compassion for the child of her womb? What's God saying? He's saying, I have this maternal part of me. I can't forget you. I can't forget you. I'm like your mother. Jesus lamented over Jerusalem in Luke chapter 13. How often he said, I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings but you were not willing. Again, that's a hen gathering chicks under wings. That's maternal. Unless you're thinking, you know, this is just a sign of weakness. God also uses this feminine reference in Hosea chapter 13. I will attack them like a bear robbed of her cubs and tear open the rib cage over their hearts. You ever seen a mother get a little upset over her baby cubs? Yeah, guess where that came from? God's maternal nature is demonstrated that way. Secondly, this idea of El Shaddai reveals about God that he has sufficient strength to nurture all who are his. He has the ability to provide the nourishment that we all need. Psalm 81 says this, listen my people and I will admonish you. Israel, if you would only listen to me, there must not be a strange God among you. You must not bow down to a foreign God. I am Yahweh your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. But my people did not listen to me. Israel did not obey me. God says, I can fill you. I can fill you. But just like Israel, our, our real trial is whether or not we're going to let him do that. In John chapter 7, we read this. On the last and the most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone is thirsty, he should come to me and drink. 
And if anyone who believes in me, as the scripture has said, I will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. Jesus says, I'm, I can satisfy. I can satisfy your hunger. I can satisfy your thirst. And then he says, he said this about the spirit whom those who believe in him were going to receive, for the spirit had not yet been received because Jesus had not yet been glorified. You see, Jesus gives this indwelling spirit as part of that nourishment that guides our entire life. So what does El Shaddai mean to us? What should it mean to us? Number one, I think it means that we need to hunger to be fed by El Shaddai. Like a newborn longs for its mother's nourishment, we should hunger and thirst for our El Shaddai sustenance. Any of you ever hold a bottle for a calf like that? My grandparents had a couple that were their friends, and you know I was the tag-along grandkid that was staying with them, but they always played cards with Claude and Molly. And so we were always going to Claude and Molly's. They were two or three miles outside of town. And as I remember, they had no children at all. So when I got there, you know, it was like I really got treated well. And, and I remember they had, they had some calves that they were, they were feeding with, with the bottle. And Claude took me out to the barn and gave me that. And I remember that, that calf about ripped it out of my hands. You know, I'm thinking it's just going, no. Vroom, vroom, vroom. And I just remember how, how hungry that calf was. And that's how we need to be spiritually. We, we don't need to toy with it. We don't need a pacifier. We need the real thing. We need to get that kind of nourishment. And that's what Peter says. Like newborn infants desire the unadulterated spiritual milk so that you may grow by it in your salvation since you have tasted that the Lord is good. We've got to taste that God is the El Shaddai. He's the supplier. He's the nourisher. We've tasted that. So we need to long for that, that unadulterated spiritual milk. The root word from which that, mean, that uh, desire grows is to yearn, to intensify, to crave. So that's what we need to be doing toward the spiritual milk that God provides. I think it also means that we need to have trust in our El Shaddai. We need to trust him. If God is able to supply our nourishment, if he is God almighty, if he is God more than enough, then the problem really is only going to come with our failure to trust him. So we need to be motivated to trust him. Again, Psalm 91 helps us in this line. The one who lives under the protection of the Most High dwells in the shadow of the Almighty. Think about that verse. The one who dwells under the protection. Again, that idea of a mother's protection. The one who dwells there is in the shadow of the Almighty. El Shaddai. The God who nourishes. The God who supplies. The God who's more than enough. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, he himself will deliver you from the hunter's net, from the destructive plague. He will cover you with his feathers. You will take refuge under his wings. His faithfulness will be a protective shield. Yeah. Thirdly, I think El Shaddai means to us that we need to claim the provisions. We need to lay claim to them. If God's able to supply, and we need to seek that nourishment, then we need to lay claim to that. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful. He will do it. Here's what that verse says. As our provider, our nourisher, our El Shaddai, God is the personification of peace. And so that, that verse is telling me that the one who's nourishing me is peaceful. And what I should be getting from that nourishment is his peace. And he says, God's going to provide that peace. He is the God who is and who makes his children righteous through and through. Not just part. He provides this nourishment and it gives us righteousness that permeates our entire person, so much so that when Paul wrote this letter, he talks about the spirit, the human part, he talks about the soul, the eternal part, and he talks about the body, the physical part. What other part do you have? 
The God of peace provides nourishment, provides what we need, that peace to our souls, to our spirits, to our bodies. And then he says, he is faithful. And then I love the way he just says, and he will do it. He will do it. So once again, it's not whether God has the ability, it's whether we are going to be trusting and going to him and laying claim to what he says he will do. Fourthly, El Shaddai should mean to us that we need to obey his nurturing truths. We need to be obedient. You know, when God gave that instruction to Abram, he was 99 years old and the Lord said to him, I am God Almighty, live in my presence and be devout. I will establish my covenant between me and you and I will multiply you greatly. What did Abraham do next? He fell to the ground. He fell to the ground. That's worship. That's adoration. That's humility. That's honoring El Shaddai, the God who will nurture. Fifthly, El Shaddai should lead us to evaluate, to find out what our level of nourishment is. Are we undernourished? Have we underfed? Have we left the nurturing heart of God and tried to do this on our own? Knowing God as El Shaddai should produce a continual spirit of introspection. We should ask ourselves questions like this. In my heart, do I sense that I'm growing? Spiritually, do I sense that I'm growing? You know, and the human part of us wants to put that off on other folks. We, we want to say that other people need to assist me in growth, and there is a, a sense in which we do aid each other in that process. But we're talking about God being the nurturer. And we're talking about our hearts in relationship to God. So the question is, in my heart, in my relationship with El Shaddai, am I feeling growth? Am I sensing that I'm being nourished from him? We could ask ourselves questions like, do I possess an intentionality on the subject of my growth? Do I have, do I have a desired plan? Am I on purpose going from point A to point B in my spiritual walk, and then from B to C, and then C to D? Do I have an intentionality of growth? Are my attitudes different than what they once were? Not just my behavior. You know, Christianity isn't just about behavior. As a matter of fact, Jesus made it pretty plain that our behaviors grow from our attitudes. So um, a deeper question is not about my behavior, but what are my attitudes? Are my attitudes different than they once were? Am I behaving differently than what I once did? The Hebrew writer will say this, we have a great deal to say about this. <laughs> And it's difficult to explain since you have become slow to understand. Think about that in the context of El Shaddai. The God of nourishment has so much that he wants to give, but the Hebrew writer says, there's an awful lot of nourishment that we would like to give you, but <laughs> you don't understand it. You don't get it. Then he continues, for though by the time that you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principle of God's revelation. You need milk, not solid food. What a powerful application as he writes about El Shaddai. You are needing the first of the nourishment of God. And then he continues. Now everyone who does live on milk is inexperienced about the message of righteousness because he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. El Shaddai, offering nourishment. He offers nourishment to the youngest of those that are his, the milk. But there is a point at which God is saying, you should be evaluating yourself sufficiently to know that you have progressed past the milk. You are now into a place where you are training your senses to distinguish between good and evil. Once again, he's not talking about what somebody else is doing to us or for us. He's talking about what we are doing to ourselves. Are we exercising that kind of training to ourselves? That the difference between good and evil is becoming more apparent to us. And if not, then just like those that the Hebrew writer was writing to, if not, then we're just still stuck on milk. 
And that means we're still spiritual infants. You know, we can be a spiritual infant and been baptized 50 years ago. We can still be a spiritual infant because we've refused to allow El Shaddai to give us the ability and the power to develop into the meat of our spiritual walk. Isaiah prophesies these words which illustrate the work of El Shaddai. I will comfort you there in Jerusalem as a mother comforts her child. When you see these things, your heart will rejoice. You will flourish like grass. Everyone will see the Lord's hand of blessing on his servants. Are you today feeling the comfort of your mother God? There's no one who comforts like mom. My kids, I remember the middle of the night, there was never a one of them called for dad. Not once. And when they scraped their knee, they didn't come to me first. They went to mom. Why? That's the nature of El Shaddai. He is the God of comfort. And don't you love how he says that when we, when we see all this, we can rejoice and we'll flourish like the grass. So do you desire to experience the maternal tenderness of El Shaddai? Here's what we've seen. We need to hunger for the feeding that he offers. We need to trust him for the nourishment that he supplies. We need to claim his provisions. We need to obey his truths. And in turn, that brings great comfort, joy, and growth. And we need to test ourselves as Paul says, to make sure that we're in the faith. But we need to test ourselves to see if we are accepting the nourishment of El Shaddai God.